Hello everyone. I wanted to do a quick video on assignment six. Uh, as we had in our Google Meet, functions are not easy. Uh, they're very different than all the other concepts you've learned so far. And I definitely gotten a lot of emails about, you know, different types of questions uh, with various problems. Now, definitely, then they're scaffolded in the sense that the first couple of tasks were easy. The last couple of ones were hard. Uh, it's always about, you know, do your best try. Uh, again, you definitely know the material uh, on a big scale. But again, the later ones are, you know, meant to challenge you. Uh, so I'm going to start off slow, uh, do a little review, and then I'm going to go over one particular one, uh, task four, uh, which was requested by Matthew. Uh, and again, I think by tackling that one, you might see how it really isn't that hard as long as you read the problem. So let's start with the first one, uh, the example. So a couple of things I want you to spot when you read a scenario. Because uh, I, I kept them pretty much straightforward. This right here, that becomes the function name. So as you can see here down, down the bottom towards the example, uh, here's where the function name goes. What comes first is the return type. Uh, and you get that by reading the problem. So it says, return the larger of two integers. So obviously, we're going to return an integer. What's also implied here is that we're receiving two integers. Now, I didn't do it for this problem, but you'll see in one of the other ones, um, I typically put the word accepts. But in any case, so we're going to return the larger of two integers. That means we need two integers to compare. So these become the parameters. Uh, and as you recall, these are variables, which means you have to specify data, a data type and then a variable name. The one thing that's different though, don't put a semicolon here. It will give you an error. Uh, for parameters, you separate the variables simply by a comma. So looking at the, the task at hand, it ends up being an if statement, where if n1 is greater than n2, then we're going to return n1. Otherwise, we're going to return n2. Now, because the problem says return, that means we need to return in the function. And because we're returning something, that means we need to specify the data type up front. This right here is the return data type. Now, creating a function is not enough. You actually have to call the function. So I made a quick call, int result max and with two numbers. And then, I mean, we could have left it like that, but obviously if we don't display the information somehow, we're not going to get anything. And hopefully you remember from the course, doing a serial print line uh, is a good way to kind of check behind the scenes the values of a variable. So if you were to run this, you would get the value of 10. All right. I'm not actually going to run it. Um, I'd rather run this on the example uh, for 10. So if you read this scenario one, this is your first one to kind of um, tackle. So you can see here, here's the function name. Now I want you to cue on this word, accepts. It accepts three integers. This is a dead giveaway that these are your parameters. These are the variables that you have to create in the parentheses after the function name. Right. Again, I'm going to demonstrate this with, with um, uh, scenario four. But again, I just want to just kind of see uh, some of the words to pick up on. So obviously the function name accepts means three integers, three variables, three parameters. And the fact that the word return is there, that means we're going to return something. Now when you take an average of three numbers, you typically are going to end up with a decimal point. So you should be returning a float. I'm not going to discuss the formula for average. Being college students, so hopefully you can figure out an average. So this becomes a function with just a simple math problem inside, not an if statement. I don't want you to think that every function needs an if statement. Uh, each of these functions, uh, I'm challenging you to kind of remember some fundamental concept that you've learned, whether it's mathematical operation, if statements, a for loop with an array, and so on. So when you look at each of these functions, look for that concept that's being tested in addition to uh, just creating a function. So let's go on to the second one. Um, here's another mathematical one. So here's the function name, which accepts a decimal Fahrenheit. So this only needs one parameter. 
one variable after the function name. And it's going to return its equivalent decimal in sense, uh, Celsius temperature. So this is another mathematical uh, function in that it's going to accept some number, do some math with it, and then return that value. Uh, moving on to this one, let's see. Uh, create a function color all, which accepts three arguments, the amount of red, green, and blue, uh, to be used for all NeoPixels. So, matter of fact, I already gave you a hint on this one. Uh, you're going to need a for loop. And I tell you that it accepts three arguments. Um, sometimes I use the word arguments for the parameters. Uh, but in any case, it accepts three things. Notice how the word return does not appear up in any of these in, in any sentence here. So that means you don't return any information. For functions that you do not return information, you use the word void. Now, here's the cool thing. Since the first day that you've worked with Arduino, uh, you've had this already, this idea of void setup. Setup is a function. So if I had to describe this function, the function name is setup. It accepts no parameters. Notice there's nothing in the parentheses. In the parentheses. This does not accept any parameters, any arguments. And because it has void here, it doesn't return anything either. Doesn't mean that setup doesn't do something. It just means that it doesn't accept information and it doesn't return information. But it does accomplish a task. And the task is to do whatever code we have here prior to entering the loop. Now, if you think of the loop, the loop's the same way. Doesn't accept any information, doesn't return any information, but we already know the loop is important to us. The loop is what keeps looping through our code. So these two are excellent examples of functions that don't accept information, don't return information, but still do a process. Okay? And that's ultimately that's what a function does. It completes a process. All right, so let's continue on. I think, uh, yes. So this is the one that was kind of challenging. Um, and if you can see here, I, I said it's an if statement. So what I want to do is I'm going to copy and paste this and put it into Arduino. And this one I'm actually going to code. So I'm going to bring it up here, uh, bring it in as a comment. Ooh. Really? All right, so let me, uh, let me chop this up a little bit so it's easier to read on the screen. OK, so create a function color which accepts two arguments, a position and the name of one of the eight basic uh, colors, red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, yellow, black, or white. So notice, we see the word accepts two arguments, a position and the name of one of these. So if you kind of look at them, notice how they're all in quotations, which means this is a string data type. Now, because the position is going to be used with the NeoPixel, we know what kind of data that is. That's a whole number from 0 to 9. So let's start creating this function uh, color. Now, the other thing I told you to, to look for, do you see the word return anywhere in the scenario? No, right? So that means that this function does not return a value. For functions that don't return a value, we specify a return type of void. Now, if you kind of think of what the word void means, it's kind of like nothing, right? Like emptiness. Uh, so that's what the word void is used for, for functions that do not return a data type. All right, so let's continue on. So we got a return data type. It's void because there is no return. Uh, next thing is the function name. So we're going to say color. And you always have to specify the parameter. I mean, the parentheses even if you're not going to put parameters, uh, just like down here. Now, in our case, we do need parameters. And the first one is a position. Now, just like a variable, if I, had to, if I asked you to create a variable called position, you'd probably do this, int position. Now, I'm not going to write the whole word because I'm going to have to keep writing this. Uh, but int position is enough. Then we're going to put a comma because there's more parameters. So the next parameter is the name of one of these colors. Now, this is where you have to start remembering your basic data types. Now, something that's in quotation is called a string. Okay, string, and we can simply say color. 
Now we know that using uh, the NeoPixel, uh, we can't we can't do this. This will not work. Uh, circuit playground set uh, pixel color. You know, in the two versions that I've showed you of the set pixel color, the first one accepts a number such as zero, and then a color combination of red, green, and blue using numbers. Uh, at no point was this able to do something like this. That's not possible. The set pixel color wasn't set up that way. That doesn't mean we can't create a function to do that, though. Uh, and this is really where you start to realize, hey, you're the programmer. You could do whatever you want. Uh, so the idea is that you got to use if statements. Uh, I didn't copy that part into the comment here. But we'll go with the first easy one. If color is red, that means the person gave us the color red as the, as the parameter for what they want. Well, we know that as a programmer, that must mean, hey, they want to do position, the position they gave us with a 255, comma, 0, comma, 0. And that's it. That is how you end up using an if statement. Now I'm going to do one more. Uh, I'm not going to do them all because I think once you get the hang of these two, uh, you'll see that the rest of them are pretty much just um, copy and paste. Uh, so let's do. I'm going to do a more interesting one. Let's do. Let's do yellow. Okay. So if the color that was passed into us was yellow, that must mean the user wants color yellow. So the color yellow is done by combining red and green and no blue. So notice at this point we have now empowered our program to do something like this. Now as you recall from the earlier discussion uh, in this assignment, a function only defines the process. Uh, you must call to the process. So let's do this. Let's do color zero comma red. And there you go. This will color the NeoPixel at the zero position with red. And just to have a little fun with this, um, and also as a little bit of review, let's say we want to do a bunch of the NeoPixels with, let's say we do, uh, let's do eight of them. I plus plus. And now I could do something like this. Color I with yellow. So notice, a function can be used with any other piece of code. Uh, it can be used with an if statement, used with a calculation. Again, it all depends on what the function does. Uh, in this case, using the function with a for loop will allow us to iterate uh, between all the positions. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to put an equal sign here so I can actually get uh, the eighth position. So I'm going to get red, a bunch of yellows, and then let's finish off with another uh, one of actually not one, nine, with red. Okay. Now the other thing that functions also do, uh, it starts to make your code a little more readable. Um, notice we're not having to you know, read this whole line of circuit playgrounds that pixel color over and over again. We simply can read, oh, it's color, here's a position, and here's the color, straightforward. Um, the other thing I also, uh, mentioned in that Google Meet earlier on was the fact that notice we don't have to write uh, circuit playground set pixel color anymore. Uh, we 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 did the hard work up here uh, to create the function that's doing the set pixel color, but then in our main program we simply call the function. So one thing to remember: uh, functions are great, but in the end, somebody has to do the work. All right? We we can't get away from not being able to do the circuit playground set pixel color. 
but at least we don't need to constantly have to retype it. Uh, so we'll type it once, get the function the way we want it, and then we can simply have the function do the work for us over and over again. All right, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and run it and do that. And I'm going to try to bring up my little camera. And let's see what we got. Okay, so um, I know I think I mentioned this in the in the previous one too. These NeoPixel lights are very bright, but you kind of see their positions zero and nine are red, and then uh, the rest of them are yellow. Just to kind of review some another concept uh, that you're probably gonna have to use here, uh, we can also go with the idea that every other color um, ends up being uh, red yellow, and we have done this in class. Uh, so. I'm going to take this out, I'm going to take this out, and that way we just have the simple for loop. And if you recall, if we simply do a plus equals two, uh, that will kind of solve our problem. Uh, and we'll do this less than 10. So for the ith position, I'll make it yellow. For the ith plus one, I'll make them red. Now, if you need a little review of the for loop, um, you could definitely do a serial print line here um, just to kind of prove to yourself that, you know, this will be zero, this will be one, and because we're increasing by two, the next value of i will be two, and then this will be two and three and so on. Okay, so let's uh, save this. Let's run it. I'll bring the little camera up. Minimize that. And there you go. So I'll bring it up a little higher. Uh, even though I think from there you could kind of get the idea. Uh, maybe that, that works out a little bit. So every other color was red and yellow. So that's the idea of a function. Um, it does a process. And the process right now is simply to be able to accept a word color uh, and then run the appropriate set pixel color. Again, in the end, this is, this is what has to get done. Um, you can't get away from this. But what we can do is make our main program more readable uh, and easier to use by creating these functions. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to kind of go through the rest of the uh, problems just to kind of give you a little hint uh, and then hopefully everybody feels comfortable tackling these. All right, so create a function tilt. There's the function name, which is based on uh, its x-axis returns. One of the circuit playground is tilted forward, two of the circuit playground is tilted backwards, or zero if it's a neutral position. So notice the word returns. Uh, so you're definitely returning one, two, or zero. Here's a hint. What kind of numbers are those um, in terms of data types? So again, I don't want to give all the, the whole assignment away. The other thing I also want to uh, bring to your attention is that you don't see the word accepts anywhere in there. So this function tilt doesn't accept information. Now, the reason it doesn't accept information is because it's going to get the information directly from Circuit Playground. Now, what you have to do is you have to remember, you know, how do you get that x-axis motion, hint, 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 uh, from the Circuit Playground? And that's what you're going to use as part of your function. Now, the other thing is, please read the problems. You see how there's the word if there? That's giving you a hint as to what kind of code you need to have inside the function. So obviously, obviously if, the, if the Circuit Playground is tilted forward, and you have to kind of remember what, um, what the motion in the x-axis hint, 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 has to be for it to be tilted forward, backwards, or zero. Uh, uh, scenario six, is that the last scenario? Yeah, this was a tough one. Uh, definitely a, a long one. Again, so one of the things I like to do with the assignments is I like to challenge you. Um, I want to give a problem that's going to be able to kind of differentiate between, you know, the... the the top students and the, you know, the ones that are a little bit less than top, you know, the hundreds from the 90s. Um, again, hopefully, hopefully you can you can respect that and, and appreciate that. Uh, that there has to be some gradient in terms of difficulty levels, uh, so that not everybody gets an A. I know everybody's like, oh, why can't we all get A's? If everybody's getting an A, then the course isn't challenging enough. Um, and <laughs> technically, I mean, we've actually been told this in a memo. Um, that you know, if your course is that easy that everybody's getting an A, then you should really elevate your course. 
So this is one of those problems uh, to kind of elevate it a little bit. But at the same time, we'll tell you that this is within your grasp. So let's read it over. Uh, create a function is pressed, which returns true. Okay, that's a different type of data type. Okay, so you're going to have to look that one up. Uh, unless I give you a hint somewhere in here, <laughs> which I don't think I did. So returns true if any of the capacitive touch pads have a value of over 200. Now we have played with the capacitive touch pads, and you have to remember what those numbers are uh, for each of the capacitive touch pads. Uh, if you forgot, I would say go back to a previous lesson, um, weekly review. Uh, I probably have it in one. I can't think off the top of my head. Uh, but if for some reason I did miss it, or if it's not in the code, you could definitely Google it. Uh, look it up, uh, what the numbers are that you use with the uh, capacitive touch pads in order to get the value from there. So the straightforward solution to this is to simply, and I tell you right there, uh, do a bunch of if statements that checks the first capacitive touch, and if the value is under 200, then simply return two, true. You kind of do that for all the capacitive touches. Now, at the very end, on the very last one, if none of the capacitive touches have been pressed, you have to return false, okay? Uh, so that's the key thing here, and actually, I, I gave you a hint right there. This is called a Boolean data type. So look up how to specify a Boolean return data type. Okay, so hopefully this gives you a little bit of a highlight uh, into each of these problems. Again, this was challenging. Um, and again, if you still have questions, please email me. Um, I'm definitely ready to start responding. Uh, good luck.